Good morning, good morning. So I hear the preacher last week gave you a description of uh, the difference between complaints and criticism. I hope he didn't encourage you in either area. <laughs> Feedback is always good though. I do have a slight confession to you all though. I'm a bit of a Christmas music junkie and I already started listening to instrumental Christmas music. I don't know if you've already done that yet. I always feel like I need to confess. But anyway, um, we do have a couple of announcements. Thanks to John and, and Jeep, um, that we have heat because we weren't sure this morning actually what, if we were gonna have the service in the uh, parish hall or not, but it's all good, so um, that's great. And also, in case you don't know, um, we do record the service. So it doesn't matter for all of you if the front of your head is combed, but the back is what you're going to see. <laughs> but also, um, you know, it's good to know that the services are now going to uh, YouTube Live and people at home. In fact, John was, so t John was here at 5 in the morning. So um, he said he's going to go home and watch the service as it's being streamed today, which is nice for him and for any of you who are traveling who would like to uh, check us out. So um, I, in other news, um, Dan last week, our church admin, uh, is resigning. And um, we put the uh, church admin resume up on Indeed. And now I already have 10 applicants. So the next week or so, uh, I'll be doing a lot of interviewing along with Rich Siegel. And I'm sure we'll find someone relatively soon. Um, and Marcy, do you want to say anything about your coffee house? I want to say something about the um, uh, Sunday choir next week. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So the fourth Sunday of the month is the Sunday choir. So those of you who want to sing in the Sunday choir next week, please come at 9.45. And the song that we sing is What a Wonderful World. Great. Any other announcements? Then let us begin to worship God. Good morning. Mm -hmm. uh, please join me in the call to worship. Uh, come away from the valleys of misplaced loyalty. Come seeking to meet the God of all worlds. We come together that our faith might be strengthened. We seek the strength to live by all we profess. God continues to deliver us in times of distress. God's steadfast love endures forever. Uh, please join me in the hymn I uh, find in the back of your hymnal, Lord of All Hopefulness.
please join me in the prayer of invocation. Gracious God, you have invited and welcomed us to this place of worship. You draw us away from the idols we create to take your place. When we come together, we sense that there is nothing in life that can substitute for a vital relationship with you. Yet we are only dimly aware of who you are. All the mysteries of the universe are in your hands, yet you have made yourself known among the people of this earth. We catch glimpses of your work among us and are amazed. We want to meet you again today as for the first time. Touch us, remake us, help us to stand firm in the faith. Amen. May the crease of Christ be with you. Please stand and share words of peace with one another.
children's message, please. You can sit on the few too if you're more comfortable there. So, um, I don't know if I think it was you. Last time you were here, you said, but I can't see God. Did you say that? You didn't? Someone who looks a lot like you said that. So I've spent a couple weeks thinking about that. And I wanted to explain it to you all. Well, does God really exist if we can't see God? Right? So. I want to talk a little bit about things that exist that we can't see. So, just a little while ago, those trees were moving. Do you know why? Because of the wind, that's right. Can we see the wind? No, we can't, but we can see the effect of the wind, right? So. You could be outside on a really sunny, hot day, and you could be really hot, but can you see heat? No, you can't see heat, right? But we can feel the effects of it, right? And if it's really cold outside, like freezing cold, can we see cold? No, we can't see cold, but cold exists, right? What? You can see snow, but you, so you can see the effects of cold, which is snow, all right? So, and one of the things I'm told, and I've never done it, is that you should never put your tongue on a pole if it's really cold outside. You know why? Your tongue will stick, even though the pole really doesn't look that different. So again, we're saying, there are things that exist, but we can't see them, right? So, when it comes to God, we can't see God, but we can see the effects of God. Okay? So, what does that mean? Have you ever tried to hug a refrigerator? <laughs> no. Why would anyone want to hug a refrigerator, right? It would be silly, right? Because nothing would happen, right? But if you hugged your mom, like, like right now, you're feeling the effects, right? And of what? That's love, right? Now, I can't see, I can't see that love happening, but I know you're experiencing that. And that's why it's so important. In one of the books of the Bible is Hebrews. And in Hebrews chapter 11, 1, uh, the author writes that faith is a belief in things unseen. So even though we can't see God, by faith we believe in God. By faith. And that's really important to understand. Just like we can't see heat or cold or wind, um, but we know it exists. We can't see God, but we know God exists because of, I think God is working through your mom to give you love right now. And that's why you feel that hug. Okay? All righty. That's really one of the harder theological questions. I hope that made sense. The scripture lesson this morning comes from Romans chapter 13, 8 through 10. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for only the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Not too long ago, on my weekly trip into the church office, 
I was listening to an iPod um, on loneliness, and, and for whatever reason, it just sort of caught my attention. I wasn't feeling particularly lonely at the time, but with my 45 to almost two hour drive sometimes, I needed something to pass the time. It was an interesting podcast, and it made me think about loneliness more from an abstract intellectual experience than a personal one, although I certainly can reflect times in my life when I did feel lonely. What I learned from that podcast is that loneliness can have a significant effect on our minds and our bodies and our emotions. Do you know that on our bodies, feeling lonely can have the same impact as smoking as cigarette, as smoking 15 cigarettes a day? And when I heard that, I thought, wow, I had no idea that feeling lonely on a regular basis could have that much of an impact on our own mortality. So the more we feel lonely, the, the less long we're actually gonna live. It also affects our brain activity. Chronic stress can lead to changes in the brain activity, including the sh shrinking of the prefrontal cortex. If you don't know what that is, it's up here, and it is the thinking best, the part of our brain that does the best thinking. It also increases the size of the amygdala, which is the midbrain, and the amygdala has to do with dealing with fear and anguish. So the more lonely we are, it actually, we're gonna feel that even more because there are actual changes in our brain. Loneliness can impair executive functions, which include skills such as decision-making, attention, and self-control. And even loneliness over a period of time can affect mental health issues. People can become more depressed, um, more anxious, and can potentially, it can even lead to psychosis and hospitalization. In addition to that, loneliness actually can affect our sleep patterns. Imagine that. And unfortunately, loneliness can potentially lead to cognitive decline and an increase of the diseases like Alzheimer's. So this idea of being lonely is, is pretty serious, it's, and that's why I'm lifting it up today. The concept of loneliness has been around in arts and literature and culture and music for a long time. Remember when the Beatles surprised the world in the 1960s and took the United States by storm? They introduced a new popular uh, form of music. Many of us were pleasantly surprised by the deep insights the Beatles actually expressed. In the song, Eleanor Rigby, for example, they sing of a woman picking up rice at a church where a wedding has been, holding on to that rice, peering through a window, living in a dream. She someday will wed. However, death comes instead. Eleanor Rigby. As she lived alone, so she died alone. And so the Beatles lament, all the lonely people, where do they come from? The Beatles had this very creative way of, it's all very poetic in, in my mind's eye, of expressing issues around humans. They tapped into a mood deeper than a lonely spinster waiting and waiting for a Prince Charming who never came to rescue here. The Beatles also wrote a song about a preacher for which no one came to hear. <laughs> one of my fears. Um, remember all the lonely people, where did they all come from? By definition, loneliness is a state of distress or discomfort that results when one perceives a gap between one's desire for social connection and the actual experience of it. Even people who are surrounded by people all day long or who are in a long-lasting marriage still can experience a deep feeling of pervasive loneliness. Our need to connect to other people is innate. 
it's deeply rooted in all of us. And I think it's actually a survival mechanism going back to our cave men and women days. We need to be needed by other people and that's how we have survived as a tribe over the thousands of years. Whether a person is in isolation or not, feeling that lack of connection can be extremely painful. Loneliness can be described in different ways. A commonly used measure of loneliness is the tool that psychologists use, and it goes something like this. They ask, how often do they feel a lack of companionship, feel left out, or feel in tune with other people around them, feel outgoing and friendly, or feel that there are no people that they can turn to? Given the potential health consequences for those who feel like they have little or no social connections, widespread loneliness poses a major societal factor. It's estimated at this point in time that 20% of all Americans struggle with loneliness. But what this says is it implies that we as a culture and as a church need to do something about it. I don't know if any of you read the former Surgeon General, Dr. Murphy, who wrote a book called Together, The Healing Power of Human Connection. It was written shortly after, maybe it was during the pandemic, but from the Surgeon General's perspective, he was saying that this is as a serious an issue as the pandemic itself. You might say, I have family and friends, but why am I still lonely? Loneliness is really tied to the quality of our relationships, not the number of relationships we have. A lack of authenticity in relationships can result in feelings of loneliness. Paradoxically, for some, the lack of or the absence of a quiet place at home can even bring on loneliness. So if your house represents a zoo of over-caffeinated monkeys, <laughs> and sometimes we've all been there, you can also feel lonely because part of dealing with loneliness is actually having quality time alone at home to recenter ourselves. And that's part of our faith tradition, to be able to be centered in prayer. That can help reconnect us to God. There are also a number of unfavorable outcomes that have been linked to loneliness. Um, forms of mental illness, type two diabetes, arthritis, and lonely people are twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. Can you imagine that? People need social connections. In fact, we need to belong or connect with other people. Some psychologists report that there are three types of loneliness. First, some people experience intimate loneliness when they feel that they don't have anybody to connect to, anyone they can talk to, being close and having a meaningful relationship with others. Secondly, others experience relational loneliness when they feel, excuse me, like they don't have a family to connect to or any kind of network. And thirdly, others experience collective loneliness when they feel generally disconnected from society. So loneliness can happen in a lot of different ways. It also needs to be said that different personalities deal with the concept of loneliness differently. For example, and I know from studies and from those that I work with in, in my field, is that extroverts during the pandemic had a hard time during the pandemic. And it makes sense, because they're so used to being out in the public and talking with people, and they get a lot of positive stimulus about that. I, myself, am not an extrovert. I'm an introvert. I was a happy camper being at home and, and doing services <laughs> in my bedroom, you know, with the picture of the church in the background. I'm fine with that. So when we talk about loneliness, it's not just one generic, everybody's the same. No, all of us respond to uh, being lonely in different ways. There's another issue that I think we also need to explore, and that sometimes loneliness can be experienced 
when it's a kind of spiritual despair. I don't know if any of you have ever read The Dark Night of the Soul. It's a hard read. It's about deep religious despair. That's not exactly what we're talking about, um, but, it, but it can feel that way. What that means is when we get into that place of where is God, I can't find any meaning and purpose in life, that's a different issue. Feeling lonely, though, is a hard topic to talk about. My wife actually asked me if I would come down after the sermon and you know, ask questions about loneliness, and I say, no, I think this topic is a little too personal. It may hit too deeply, and I don't want people to feel that vulnerable in community. Because sometimes our experience of loneliness comes with a sense of shame, believe it or not. We may think that somehow I'm inadequate, I shouldn't feel lonely, I don't want other people to know that I'm lonely. But what we need to be acknowledging is that loneliness is just part and parcel of being a human being. So I tried to spend most of my sermon telling how horrible loneliness is. And I hope I didn't make you feel more lonely or depressed because of it. That wasn't my intent. And I even wonder, as I preach this sermon, I can see the glaze in some people's eyes. Like, you know, I might have hit a spot within you. All I'm trying to do today is just to lift up the concept to normalize it and to give you opportunities to think about how you can overcome it. The scripture lesson actually says a lot about how we can overcome loneliness in the context of our faith community. Paul writes that love is the fulfillment of God's law. The Beatles had another way of saying it. They simply sang, and I know you know the song, all you need is love, all you need is love. Maybe we need to advertise our church as providing FaceTime without something that requires a battery or a screen. Maybe we should have a sign outside that says real FaceTime every Sunday with coffee. You know, that might shock a few people. In fact, I know from the studies of, you know, of children that have been born since the internet started in 1975, that many of our youngsters actually are, are, and they're not young anymore, they're already almost in their 30s, um, are having a hard time with depression because they spend way too much time on their electronic devices. We need as a church community to express what we do in better ways. We need to remind this Harwich community that we don't ask a lot. All you have to do is show up on Sunday and hopefully listen to a reasonably good worship service. And then you can come and have coffee hour afterwards with cake and goodies, and, and I think that's amazing. And I think that's probably why most people come to church. You know, because actually when you think about it, on an average Sunday, our service is about 45 minutes to 55 minutes coffee hour is at least an hour and 15 minutes. So which do people value more? And for me, that's a good thing. It is, because guess what? Your community needs, I mean that as an individual, are being met. You're talking with real people. You're engaging. And that's so vitally important in terms of all of our mental health. And for me, Staying for the whole coffee hour is actually a blessing. Maybe not good for my tummy, but, <laughs> but it is a blessing. Amen. So let us now stand and sing Love Divine, All Love's Excelling in your bulletin.
be seated. Let us pray. We pray, O oh gracious God, that the word fight be replaced with the word love throughout our world. We pray for Tommy, who's facing brain surgery. And we pray for solace and peace for the family of Amy Brooks, who passed away last Sunday. Amy was Shirley, Shirley's sister. Lord, gracious and compassionate God, we also acknowledge and we lift up that yes, oh Lord, there are times when we do feel lonely. Help us to take those times and think about what we can do about that. Maybe we need to reach out to friends. Maybe we need to spend time in prayer. Maybe we need to go for a walk to get recentered. For we know that loneliness can be a painful experience. We pray for those who are homeless and without shelter, without food. We think of Destiny who contacted the church and the church was able to help her. We think of others who don't have the help of faith-based organizations. We pray for all those in transition, whether it's physical or emotional or spiritual. Guide each of us in our daily walk with you. All this we say in the name of him who taught us to pray by saying together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us continue to worship God by the giving and receiving of our morning offering.
away like I try to repay all I've taken from you. Maybe, Lord, I could show someone else when I've been through my spell on my way back to you. say together our prayer of dedication. May our offerings help to prepare many to feast at your banquet table. May our generosity reflect the amazing abundance you entrust to our care. As we find joy in giving, may others be inspired to give their best, and may all of us realize your peace dwelling within and among us as we serve in Christ's name. Amen. And now let us sing as our closing hymn, I Sing a Song of the Saints of God.
Now go in peace with your heart filled with God's love. Amen.